A freshman at a prestigious university disappeared without a trace after a sports match, leaving her open car and keys in the parking lot. The police did not investigate the case, thinking that the young woman had simply run away, but her parents and friends knew that something terrible had happened. For 12 years, the mystery remained unsolved, and only after all this time did the truth come out. Shannon Melendi was born on October 20, 1974, in Miami, USA. Five years later, her parents had a second daughter, Monique. From an early age, the girls were taught that their first priority should be to get a quality education. This approach has had a strong influence on Shannon. From the first years of school, she studied only on the excellent, while finding time for various clubs and sections, where she was also ahead of her classmates in all respects. In high school, the young woman firmly decided that she wanted to tie her future career with politics or law. She headed the school debate club, and in her last year of school, she even made a speech to the U.S. Congress and the General Assembly of the United Nations as part of special training programs. It was after these events that she finally decided she wanted to work on the Supreme Court. To achieve this goal, she needed a good legal education and Shannon sent applications to several of the country's top universities. Given her impeccable grades and accomplishments in extracurricular activities, all universities and colleges were willing to accept her, but she chose Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. In addition to the fact that it was one of the top 20 universities in the country, the young woman was offered an annual grant of $15,000 for the first four years of study. That way, she could cover most of her tuition. After graduation, she moved to Atlanta to study political science. The university made a great impression on her. She quickly settled in and made many friends. Despite the grant that Shannon received, she also got a part-time job. A few kilometers from her dorm was a softball field that needed employees. Her duties included keeping an eye on the score of the game. On March 26, 1994, Shannon had to quit her job because of an error by her supervisor. That morning, another employee was supposed to keep score, but the young woman was accidentally added to the schedule and agreed to work the game. Shannon arrived at the stadium at about 8.40, and four hours later, her shift was over. Usually after work, the young woman would stop at a gas station nearby to buy a soda. That day, she left as well. Only, no one saw her again. The stadium management expected her to return after halftime to turn in her scorecard, but she never did. Her friend and roommate, Athena, was the first to sound the alarm. At first, she was alarmed when Shannon didn't return to her dorm in the evening. She had nowhere else to sleep and was unlikely to stay with anyone. After not waiting for her roommate the next morning, she decided to call her parents to see if she had contacted them in the last 24 hours. Shannon's parents were at work at the time, so her younger sister came to the phone. She told Athena that she hadn't spoken to Shannon in the past few days and promised to ask her parents when they got home. Athena became increasingly worried and told two mutual friends about the young woman's disappearance. Then they decided to look for her on their own. They got in their car and started to drive around the campus. Eventually, they reached the stadium where Shannon worked, and there, a disturbing discovery awaited them. As they approached, they noticed a gas station near the stadium and, to their surprise, spotted Shannon's car there. It was a black Nissan 280SX that her parents had given her. As they pulled up to the gas station, the friends found the car empty, but the keys were in the ignition and the doors were unlocked. All this only increased their anxiety. Shannon would never leave her car much less with the keys and the doors open. Ever since her parents had given her this car, she had cared for it reverently. Realizing that something terrible might have happened to the young woman, her friends called the police. Only the officers who arrived on the scene treated the situation as irresponsible as possible. They took a cursory look at the car and concluded that there was no evidence of a possible crime. There was no blood or signs of struggle in the car, so the officers simply advised their friends not to worry. They didn't even take fingerprints off the steering wheel and doors. Moreover, they asked Athena to take the car to the university parking lot, which she did. 
The officers talked to the gas station attendants and they confirmed that they had seen Shannon around noon yesterday. They also did not notice anything suspicious. Ultimately, the official police version was that, given there was no signs of blood or struggle in the car, Shannon had probably just run away somewhere. Given that she was 19 years old at the time, no one was going to seriously investigate the case. That evening, Shannon's parents decided to go immediately to Atlanta to participate in the search. Upon learning that the police were unwilling to investigate their daughter's disappearance, they did everything they could to change that, and in many ways it worked, thanks to Shannon herself. After she spoke to Congress, the young woman was accepted into a nonprofit organization by Jimmy Carter, the former President of the United States. Shannon's parents brought it to his attention that their daughter was missing, and he, along with Senator Bob Graham, secured FBI involvement in the case. The parents flew to Atlanta and began a search for their daughter. Along with other students, they printed and posted thousands of flyers about Shannon's disappearance, and, a little later, her father rented a billboard. Along with this, he announced a reward of $10,000 for any information that would help find the young woman. Detectives identified several suspects among Shannon's acquaintances, but quickly became convinced of their innocence. Three days after the young woman disappeared, something interesting happened. An unidentified man called the police on the hotline number listed on the flyers about Shannon's disappearance. He stated that the reporters had made a mistake in reporting on the young woman's disappearance. They said that Shannon was wearing green shorts the day she disappeared, but that they were actually blue. Further, the caller stated that he had Shannon and was going to hold her as long as he wanted. There is one very confusing point with this call, and that is, why wasn't it given any weight? Despite the caller saying that he had kidnapped Shannon, law enforcement continued to believe that the young woman had run off somewhere. This went on for several more days, until an unidentified man made a second call on April 6th. This time, he called the university's counseling center and said that Shannon was at his place and that she was fine. He promised to call later to make demands for her return. Finally, he said he would leave Shannon's ring for the police near where he was calling from to confirm his words. This time, the FBI quickly traced the call and found that it was made from a payphone located near a Burger King restaurant in suburban Atlanta. Upon arriving at the location, Detectives did find the ring there in a cloth baggie that was wrapped in duct tape. Shannon's parents confirmed that the ring did indeed belong to her. For them, this news was a relief in the first place because they got a chance to see their daughter alive again. Since then, they have been waiting for the perpetrator to call again and make his demands. This event also led to law enforcement finally reclassifying the disappearance case as a kidnapping. The police department appointed a new lead detective, and he immediately noted the unprofessionalism of his predecessors. According to him, almost all of their actions were flawed. They did not take fingerprints from Shannon's car, instead asking a stranger to drive and drive the car to another location. They also did little or nothing to investigate the case, since they thought the young woman had simply run off somewhere and would be back soon. With all this in mind, investigators decided to work every possible lead from scratch, and the first thing they focused on was the softball field where Shannon was last seen the day she disappeared. Complicating the situation was the fact that by then, several weeks had passed since the young woman had gone missing. In addition, there was a championship game on the field that day, which brought the total number of visitors and participants to over several hundred. The detectives attempted to question as many people as possible, urging them to recall any suspicious moments at the game. To their surprise, many told the same story. The only oddity at that game was the behavior of the referee. According to the players and stadium staff, he was extremely dismissive of his job. He was distracted all the time, including during key events. Instead of doing his job, he was constantly trying to talk to Shannon and ask her out. The judge's name was Colvin Hitton, but he himself preferred to use the nickname Butch. The 33-year-old man worked as a mechanic for the local Delta Airlines, 
while refereeing matches was his hobby. He had a wife, taught Sunday school at the church, and seemed quite harmless. The detectives began to dig deeper and discovered that Butch had left the softball field at almost the same time as Shannon. After talking to his co-workers, they found out another strange thing. The day before the game, he had asked the other umpires to fill in for him at that game because he was supposed to have a date that day. They all knew that Butch was married, but he stated that his wife was out of town for a few days. When all his co-workers said no, he called his boss and asked him to leave the game early. The man explained that his brother's wife was in the hospital and they had no one to leave the children with. Except that day, Butch returned to the stadium two hours after he had left and was still wearing his officiating uniform. He went into the locker room, changed, and left. Three hours later, he returned to the stadium where he was spotted by a colleague. When asked what he was doing there, Butch said he had forgotten to give his paycheck to the accounting department, but he didn't have his paycheck with him. Moreover, Butch asked his colleague if he had seen where his car was parked. For a man who had just arrived at the stadium, that question sounded very strange. Investigators questioned Butch, and he denied any involvement in the young woman's disappearance. According to him, after the club, he went straight home. As proof, he showed detectives several outgoing calls from his phone made less than 40 minutes after leaving the stadium. He was offered a polygraph interview. Butch agreed and failed it. Almost all of the answers were deemed false, but it wasn't enough to arrest him. It was, however, enough to obtain a search warrant for his house, which, incidentally, was located near the burger joint where the police found the Shannon ring. Detectives discovered two other curious facts. Butch's neighbors said that he had lit a fire in the early morning hours after the day Shannon disappeared. Later, the man called his father and asked him for a handsaw, stating that a tree had fallen on his car. Detectives went to his house with their service dogs, but they were unable to find any sign of Shannon's presence there. But an interesting discovery awaited them on the property. They noticed three places with overgrown soil. When they dug them up, they found something really creepy. Under the ground were dozens of items of women's clothing and shoes, as well as a sleeping bag and some softball field scorecards. Experts examined the excavated clothing, showed pictures to Shannon's parents, and concluded that none of it belonged to the young woman. Butch himself said he had no idea where on his property such hiding places came from. He assumed it was all left over from the past owners of the house, in the end, the police were in a tricky situation. A lot of facts pointed to Butch's involvement in Shannon's disappearance, but at the same time, there was not a single direct clue against him. They hoped that a more detailed examination of the young woman's car would bear fruit, but here too, they were out of luck. Because the police did not take fingerprints and look for DNA samples on the first day of the investigation, the experts were not able to find them, but they came to an interesting conclusion. Someone had thoroughly wiped down the car, destroying any potential traces. In an effort to find some hard evidence against Butch, one of the detectives dug up a really interesting fact. He examined the bag containing the Shannon ring and discovered that such items are not manufactured for retail sale. He contacted the manufacturer and learned that the only buyer of such bags in the state of Georgia was Delta Airlines. The company itself stated that the bags were used by mechanics to store small airplane parts, and as we recall, Butch worked as a mechanic for that very company. And that's not all. The detectives went over the whole thing so thoroughly that they found another tiny clue. In Butch's car, they found a piece of the same duct tape in which the pouch had been wrapped. On the tape itself, the experts found microscopic particles of the same metal. After studying its composition, they concluded that this compound is used only in the aviation industry. In spite of all this, the case was frozen for many months. The police and Shannon's parents were sure that Butch was behind the young woman's disappearance, but no one could prove his involvement. All the evidence was circumstantial. 
As soon as the airline learned of the suspicions about the man, they quickly fired him. Before that, he had managed to brag mockingly to his colleagues that he was a suspect in a case of kidnapping a woman. After reviewing his background, investigators discovered that Butch had quite an impressive criminal history under his belt. They didn't know this at the beginning of the investigation because there was no advanced criminal databases back in the 90s. It turned out that he had committed his first crime when he was still a minor. He got a part-time job and one day went to his boss's house where only his wife was there. Butch tried to tie her up, but he failed. The woman then convinced him that if he left, she wouldn't tell anyone what had happened. He believed her and left the house and the woman immediately called the police. Butch was arrested, but due to his age, he was only ordered to undergo involuntary psychiatric treatment. This despite the fact that he admitted that he wanted to abuse the woman. The next time he went to the police was for kidnapping a 14-year-old young woman when he was in his 20s and had a wife. He called his younger brother's ex-girlfriend and told her he wanted to meet her. He assured her that his younger brother would be with him except he came alone to the meeting. Then, Butch said that his brother asked him to give her a gift. He asked her to put her hands together, then wrapped a rope around them and took the young woman to his house, where he locked her in the basement. It is unknown how the story might have ended, but Butch's wife accidentally discovered the victim and called the police. The young woman told investigators that Butch molested her, but despite this, he was only sentenced to four years in prison. The victim also shared some very disturbing information. Butch told her that if she didn't comply with him, he would do to her what he had done to the previous two, whatever that meant. Released early, less than two years later, he remarried. His new wife was unaware of Butch's criminal past. The police believed these were far from all of Butch's crimes. Buried women's clothing indicated that he may have had other victims that he did not leave alive. Shannon's investigators were never able to get any charges against Butch in the case, so they continued to look for any potential evidence, but to no avail. In December 2003, Butch was released early from prison after spending eight and a half years there. In all that time, the police could not come close to charging him with kidnapping Shannon, but they were somewhat lucky. While in prison, Butch frequently hinted to other inmates about his involvement in the case, and many of them agreed to testify against him. Detectives interviewed about 10 inmates. One of them, Adonis Cornwell, said he woke up in the middle of the night to a scream from his cellmate, Butch. He said in tears that he had not killed Shannon. The demons inside him had done it for him. He asked the other inmates what the chances were of going to prison for murder if the victim's body was never found. To one of the inmates, he almost confessed what he had done. Butch told him that he had left the softball field with Shannon and that the police had been extremely stupid for not examining her car properly. He also said that her body would never be found because it had been scattered in the wind. This testimony combined with all the previous circumstantial evidence gave investigators a chance to bring the case to trial. Six months later, in August 2004, they finally arrested Butch for the first time on charges of kidnapping and murder. According to the investigation, Butch saw Shannon at a gas station and under some pretext, lured her into his car. Next, he threatened her to drive to his house or he drove himself. Given that his past known crimes had been committed with knives, it could have been the same in Shannon's case. He then locked her in the house and drove back to the stadium, parking the young woman's car at the gas station. He left the keys in the ignition, wiped off all prints, and left. When he returned home, he could have abused the young woman, killed her, and then disposed of the body. Few people believed the court would convict. I think everyone is familiar with the phrase, no body, no case, and in the vast majority of cases, it fully reflects reality. It is extremely difficult to prove that a person committed a murder if no one has even seen the victim's body. At the time, there was not a single case in Georgia where a court had convinced a person without a body. 
but investigators went to great lengths to squeeze the most out of the circumstantial evidence they had. They even brought in prisoners to the trial who had heard hints of Shannon's murder from Butch. He himself insisted on his innocence, and after the trial was over, the jury could not decide on a verdict for three whole days, but eventually they made their decision and found Butch guilty of murder. Consequently, the court sentenced him to life in prison. He was 43 years old at the time, and in theory he should have spent the rest of his life behind bars. But there was one unpleasant nuance. The perpetrator was eligible to apply for parole every seven years, according to the statutes in effect at the time of the murder. Butch tried to challenge the court's decision, but he failed, and two years later, in 2006, something really unexpected happened he decided to confess to the murder. His story was almost exactly the same as the prosecution's. He saw Shannon in the parking lot and suggested she go to Burger King for a bite to eat. Shannon agreed, and they drove there in his car. After eating lunch, they drove back to the field. Only Butch missed the right turn, stopped the car, and said his leg was cramped. He asked Shannon to drive and got in the back seat. There, he pulled out a prepared knife and threatened to force the young woman to drive to his house. There, he tied her up and told her he wasn't going to hurt her. Butch said he only wanted to sell her car, after which he intended to let her go. She behaved calmly and did not try to scream or fight back. Leaving her tied up in the house, Butch returned to the stadium, drove Shannon's car to the gas station, and left the keys inside. He did this in the hope that someone would steal it and it would help throw the police off the scent. After thoroughly wiping the steering wheel and other places where he might have left fingerprints, Butch returned home, abused the young woman, and left for the movie theater with his nephews and their parents. Apparently, this family outing he had originally planned as an alibi. When he returned home, he abused Shannon again while constantly repeating that he would let her go as soon as he sold her car. He then allegedly began to realize the gravity of what he had done and tried to figure out what to do next. He went to bed, but woke up a few hours later and began to panic. Then he went down to Shannon's house, put a tie around her neck, and cut her off. According to Butch, she was asleep at the time and it all happened very quickly. Next, he spent hours wondering what to do with the body. By morning, he decided to burn it, built a large fire, and added fuel. Putting the body there, he changed his clothes and went to the service at church. When he returned home, the fire had allegedly destroyed all remains. The man said that the unbearable weight of the guilt made him confess to what he had done, but it was hard to believe. First, he made two taunting calls to the police and the university, telling them that Shannon was alive while he had already disposed of her body. Second, he planned to kidnap another woman his wife's best friend, that day. As soon as his wife went out of town, he called her and asked her to come over. Allegedly, he and his wife wanted to meet her, but the friend refused, which saved her life. Knowing this, can we speak of any remorse and guilt on the part of Butch? In addition, he stated that the fire had turned the body to ashes in a matter of hours, which seems impossible. According to the man, when he came home from church, there was no trace of Shannon. He allegedly waited for the ashes to cool, gathered up the ashes, and dumped them on the railroad tracks. Most likely he lied and had to bury the remains, including the bones, somewhere. But why would he do that? The only option here was that Butch realized he might never be released and decided to play the remorse game. But if he had pointed out where the body had been buried, his sentence might have been altered and denied him the opportunity to petition for release. He continued to insist that the fire in his house was really caused by a broken vacuum cleaner, despite the traces of fuel that experts found. As of now, he is still in prison, and his next petition for parole can be filed in 2025, when he will be 64 years old. Shannon's parents continue to fight to ensure that he is never released. The only question that gnaws at investigators to this day is whose belongings were buried in Butch's backyard. Was he involved in the deaths of other young women, which could number in the dozens? Share your thoughts of this story in the comments, and thanks for watching.